We are helping people find the way, the truth, and the life. Let's say it again. Helping people find the way, the truth, and the life. One more time. Helping people find the way, the truth, and the life. That is who we are. That is why we are here. That is our mission at Faith Baptist Church. The reason why our, our, our uh, organization exists, if you would, is for the purpose of helping people find the way, the truth, and the life. Now, to review a little bit, uh, that, that mission statement gives us our purpose, but it also gives us our process. Because we, as a church, our theme has been, will you be, also be as disciples? We've been looking at discipleship, and we realize that a church must be a, a, a to be a healthy church, must be a ministry that is uh, making disciples who make disciples. And our mission statement gives us our process on how disciples at Faith Baptist Church. So let's review that. We're helping people find the way. What is the way? Well, Jesus gave the context when we looked at John chapter 14, verse 6, where we, we draw this verse from. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He says he's going to his Father, and he says, you know where I'm going, and the way you know. And of course, we had old doubting Thomas <laughs> saying, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? In Jesus' powerful statement, I am the way. Jesus was going to his Father. He was going to be in heaven with God. And for mankind to have access to God after our, our, our fallen sinful nature, Jesus became that way. He is the access. He is the road. He is the path, if you would, to get to God. And in our church, we look at the way. We're, we're trying to lead people to a relationship with God. We're trying to lead people to come into knowledge, of saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We do that through outreach. We do that through evangelism. We do that through our, 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 our services, our Monday, our, sorry, our Sunday and Wednesday night services. We're, we're gathering to point mankind to God. That's why we're here. That's what we're doing. That's, that's our purpose. It's also our process. You see how that all ties together? And then we saw, not only are we helping people find the way, we're, through evangelism, we're reaching the lost to come to Christ, but we're also helping people find the truth. The truth. Jesus defined truth in two ways. He said to his Father in a prayer, Thy word is truth. And he said, I am truth. So as we are trying to lead people to find truth, that means as a church, our job is to help people build a deeper relationship with Jesus, who is truth, through his word, through the Bible, which is the truth. Now, we do that here through uh, things like smaller groups like Sunday, Sunday night discipleship, those types of areas where we're opportunities to dive deeper and study God's truth and the more we know God's word the more we get to know Jesus the third part in our purpose our process we're helping people find the way the truth and the life the life the Anthony I might just switch over here that one's acting up again uh, number two the life what do we mean by that I have the power. Yes. Uh, we mean by, when we talk about the life, we're talking about something practical, something tangible, something that's, that, that, that's very real and impacting things around it. That's what life does. That's, what, that's you know, who, as we are alive. I was telling, um, um, I was teaching my Sunday school class, and I said, nobody's an island unto themselves. Every person is going to have a life that touches other lives also. And when Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, he was saying, I, I, I'm a, I, am, I am life, I am living, I am real, I am practical. And as Jesus reached his disciples and taught them to make disciples also, he was giving them a whole new way of living. They were putting aside the old rudiments of the law and the traditions of their fathers to follow in the grace of Jesus and to share Jesus with the world. 
Now, how does that fit in our process? Well, we do that through ministry. So every person at Faith Baptist Church, if we're going to buy into the process of Faith Baptist Church, first of all, we, we, we find the way. We come to know God. We, and that's, we're pointing people to God. And if you're here, you've never received Jesus as your Savior. That's the first step. That's where it all begins. Then we saw the truth. Each person at Faith Baptist Church ought to be involved in growing in the truth. So each person ought to be involved in, you know, if our process is through evangelism or, or, and our morning service, everybody, or Wednesday service, everybody ought to be in a, a main service. Everybody in Faith Baptist Church ought to be in a smaller group, a Sunday school or, or a, a Sunday night discipleship or, or, or you know, whatever else we will have in the future that's, that's focused on that area of ministry. Each person should be growing in the truth. Each person should be developing more and more in their walk with God. And then uh, the life, every person, every member of Faith Baptist Church ought to find a way to be serving in ministry. If we're going to buy into the purpose and the process of our, church, of our church, every person, every member ought to tie in in one of those three areas. And we work our way th along that path. We don't start with service and then get saved later on. No, it begins with salvation coming to know God and then developing that relationship and then get involved in ministry and as we serve in ministry we learn how to take others through that same process also that's how we function that's how we do what we do at Faith Baptist Church another thing we discussed in that meeting in a sense was what I'm going to use the word strategy how, how, how are we going to do this well it comes back to that first step the way we're going to share Christ with our community. I don't want to just today preach on this subject, Faith Baptist Church beyond our four walls. Faith Baptist Church beyond our four walls. How many that were in the business meeting? Remember we talked about that. We're going beyond the four walls of our church. Jesus never intended for his followers to isolate themselves off from the world and have this little sect of people that sit around and, 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 and look at everybody outside of that group and condemn them and say, well, you know, they're just, they're just, they're lost. They're, they're just a mess. Jesus called his followers to go out and to engage the world. We saw it in our text verse this morning. Jesus said, go ye therefore... So, since all power was given unto him in heaven and earth, and we represent him, go. Go in my name. Go out and, and, and engage the lost and dying world. Go out and engage people that do not believe in my name. Go out to the world around you. And we decided at Faith Baptist Church that we are going to really focus at engaging our community for Jesus Christ. We asked a very pointed question during that meeting some of you will remember it when, as soon as I start mentioning it the question was this if Faith Baptist Church were to close its doors tomorrow would Silver Springs and Stagecoach even know that we we're gone and the hard answer was no. We've not been engaging our community like we're supposed to. We've not been uh, getting out and sharing the gospel like we ought to have been. Oh, we, we became focused on one area. We, we had a door knocking program, and that was the only way we did it, and it was the only way you could do it. But God has called us to do so much more. He has given us this thing. We call it the Great Commission. Sadly, so many treat it like the Great Omission. Something we can leave off, but that's not what we have been challenged to do. God has called us. And I want to give us three things about the Great Commission as we look at our, our purpose here at Faith Baptist Church and, and reaching the lost and engaging the community and engaging the world around us. Three things that I believe will be very practical and helpful for each and every one of us to go outside of these four walls, go out to the mission field, and make an impact for the cause of Christ. Number one, I want us to see that the Great Commission is a routine commission. It's a routine commission. By that I mean he didn't limit it to one time a year. One event. 
It wasn't a short-term missions trip he was sending them on. He was saying, I want you to go. I've heard uh, some preachers, and I'm not you know, a great uh, student of Greek from which our New Testament is translated. And I, I know there are good men that disagree, but they look at the Great Commission and the, 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 the tense of that com- commandment to go. And, you know, in our English language, we have you know, tense. We have present tense, future tense. We have participles and all those wonderful things you learned about and then forgot in, uh, in high school. But the idea that is mentioned there is the idea that it could be said, as you go. Jesus wasn't necessarily saying, all right, I want you to go on limited times and then for limited purposes. He was saying, no, no, no. As you're going about life, He was assuming you're going to go. You're going to go to the marketplace. You're going to go to work. You're going to go to school. You're going to go to places of leisure. You're going to go to, you know, family events. You're going to go to religious events. But as you go, wherever you go, I want you to be my witness. I want you to share the gospel. You know what that does? That puts on us the mindset that every opportunity could be a gospel opportunity. Every person with whom we have contact can be a person with whom we can share the gospel. I think it was Miss Claudia mentioned she was at Walmart and got to talking to a guy, and we were praying for him on Wednesday, Christopher, to come to know Christ. And when we get this idea as far as the Great Commission, then we limit it to one event. And in our church, for many years, that one event has been door-to-door confrontational soul winning. That's how we've done it. That's, just, this, 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 that's been our, our tradition. That's been our way of, of doing things. And it's not bad. Is it a good thing to go to people, you know, where they are and, and try to share the gospel? Yeah, that's a good thing. But I believe what happened is we got focused on that being the only time we share the gospel. And that's not what Jesus calls us to do. It's a routine commission. To some, they look at the word go as only door to door. To some, they look at the word go as only going to a foreign mission field like Brother Rick or Miss Claudia will do. They'll go to Uganda for a short term. They say, well, you know, that's, that's when you share the gospel. But let's, let's broaden our focus a little bit. Who is that cashier that you see you know, once or twice a month? You go to the grocery store, maybe some of you, you go once a week. Most of us were out here in Silver Springs, so we go like once a month, stock up, and then bring it all back to our little bomb shelter, you know? <laughs> but who is that person you see regularly? How can you share the gospel with them? You go to the restaurant. How can you share the gospel with that person? I mean, look, look at those as opportunities. They're, you, know, you don't have to go all the way to Uganda to find somebody who's lost. You can go to Fernley or here in Silver Springs or in Stagecoach. You can go all wherever you go. It's a routine commission. See, Jesus wanted his disciples to go to all nations. All nations is not contained in, in one set you know, parameter of, of doing things. All nations is everybody, wherever, whenever, however. That's why we've been you know, focusing more and more on evangelism. That's why we're running a vacation Bible school. Because we want boys and girls from all over Silver Springs and Stagecoach and in some cases Fernley to come to know Jesus as their Savior. That's why we've had Tim here. Tim and I were working on a gospel presentation video, and that'll be an awesome tool to use. We put it out on social media, and a series of videos. It'll go on a DVD. It can be handed out. That's what we're trying to do. We're looking at opportunities to go to where people are in regular, everyday events and share the gospel. That's why we're doing uh, the, the, uh, these um, craft fairs once a month. Our church is going and setting up a booth and we're handing out animal balloons and New Testaments. We're trying to look for opportunities to share the gospel. We're not looking at having to go, to, uh, you know, to visit Brother Chitty in New Mexico. We can go to the people that are around us. But it's a routine commission. A routine commission. 
Let me say this also about the Great Commission. It is a relational commission. A relational commission. In other words, you've got to get to know people. There's a saying, it's probably a cliche by this point, but, you know, you probably already heard it. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Have you ever heard that statement? Let's apply it to the gospel. Here we have, we are Christians. We have the hope that passes all understanding. We have the peace of God. We have the joy in knowing that our names are written in heaven. We have Jesus as our Savior. That is phenomenal, wonderful news. And we go out to the world and we say, you need to receive Jesus. And the world says, why? Well, our church is here. We want to teach you Christ. What's your church ever done for me? What's your Jesus ever done for me? And look, at, look at Jesus' life. Everywhere Jesus went, he built relationships. He touched people. I'm not saying we go around and you know, play a, this, this weird game of religious tag. That's not what I'm saying. Don't misunderstand me. But he made an impact in people's lives. He, he, he got to know them, their cares, their concerns, their worries, their needs. He ate with people in their homes because they didn't have, you know, <laughs> they didn't necessarily have restaurants back then, I guess. He spent time with people. That was the culture. That was what they did. He walked with people. He got on the boat with the fishermen. He went to the leper. He touched the blind. He followed a man named Jairus to the deathbed of his little girl. And he didn't leave her there. He intercepted a funeral procession. I mean, he, he, he engaged in people's lives. You know, that's what we're called to do as well. And I know that is so countercultural to those of us that live in Silver Springs. Because for the vast majority of us, we move out here because we don't want to have to interact with people. I mean, we can have five acres literally in the middle of nowhere <laughs> we can do our own thing we can go all week long and not have to interact with a single human being outside of our family and for most of us that is awesome but that's not quite what Christ has called us to do now I'm not saying you know, you're, you're introverted so you have to all of a sudden switch to be an extrovert. That's not what I'm, I'm saying. God, God knows your personality. God made you the way he made you. But can you look outside yourself and find some, just, just one. We should start with one. One person that you can build a relationship with and love on that person regardless of what that person can or cannot do for you. You know, our church, one of the things we're working and doing, we're trying to have uh, 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 groups come and use our facilities. We're trying to build relationships with, with, with leaders in our community. We're trying to get to know people here, not because of what they can or cannot do for us, but because we love them and we want to do something to serve them. Our church is not here for the community to serve Faith Baptist. Faith Baptist is here to serve our community. They're not just prospects to fill our, our pews. They're people we get to love on. We get to care about. We get to really reach out and impact their lives. Is that how do we do that? Well, in small ways. Start small ways. I had, uh, uh, Peggy, you and I were talking about this yesterday. You brought that can of you know, food in, and I got to uh, go uh, meet with a group that was trying to do some food bank type stuff and, and feed some homeless uh, uh, families and, and you know, we saw on, on, on social media how that had already gone to help somebody you say well great we'll make those people now come to be a part of our church you missed the point we're just we're going to love on people 
I have a friend that called me. His name's Matt. We were praying for him on Wednesday. Matt grew up in a Christian home, but he's not a Christian. And Matt, Matt's going through a rough time. He had some burdens that he, he wanted to share. He said, I, just, I need somebody to talk to. I'm so glad that Matt called me and let me be that person. And then here's this guy. He, he's not a believer. But he let me sit down with him on the phone and pray for him and his circumstance and in his situation. I hope Matt will receive Christ. But I'm not, I'm not building a relationship, a friendship with him so that I can get a little notch in my gospel gun. It's not how it works. See, it's a relational commission. When Jesus said, go into all the world, what's contained in that is he's saying, go share me. Go tell them about me. And Jesus, as much as he is truth, he is love. That's probably one of God's characteristics. God is love. It's not that just God does love. Part of the very DNA makeup of God is love. Charity, as the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The Greek word agape, this this boundless, limitless love. Unconditional. Nothing that they do for us that warrants it. We just love them. It's relational commission. You go to your friends. Remember the maniac of Gadara? We looked at him a while, a few, a few weeks ago. What did Jesus instruct him? Go tell your friends. Go tell your neighbors what, Jesus, what I've done for you. Now, he couldn't keep it contained to just his friends and neighbors. He went through all Decapolis, that 10-city league, and, and just shared what this man Jesus had done for him. And when Jesus came back, the crowds were there. The multitudes were there. It's a relational. It's what we've called to do. I think of in John chapter 1. Remember when Peter came to cry, or sorry, when uh, uh, Andrew started following Jesus? What did Andrew go do? Andrew went and found Peter, his own brother, and said, hey, we found the Messiah. You know, it's interesting. You read through the Gospels, you find Andrew. Andrew is always focusing, like Jesus is, on on relationships. He's bringing people to Jesus. He brings the little lad with the lunch. He brings uh, uh, blind people. He brings, he brings people to Christ. He's building relationships. I think of Philip. What did Philip do when he started following Jesus? He went and found his friend Nathaniel. And Nathaniel, he was a bit of a skeptic. Can a good thing come out of Nazareth? Remember what Philip said there? I, 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 think, I hear Philip say that. It makes me think of Silver Springs. Can any good thing come out of Silver Springs? <laughs> Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And yet when he found Jesus, when Philip brought his friend Nathaniel to Jesus, Nathaniel said, my Lord, my God, I'm going to follow you. You know, that takes this routine commission, and, and it does, in a sense, make it a little easier because we're building relationships with people because we love on them. It's, it's just natural to share Christ with them if we care about them. Number three. Watch this. It's a required commission. Take your Bible. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. Now for those that might not know, the one, you know, God, the, the, the human writer that God used to pen the book of Corinthians the books of first and second Corinthians was a man by the name of Paul Paul was an apostle he was a a, a, a leader in the early church Paul is also probably one of the greatest missionary church planters that this world has ever seen if anybody shared Christ with the world it was Paul but notice what Paul says in first Corinthians chapter 9 and verse number 16. He says, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. It means I got nothing to boast about. I'm doing this thing, I'm preaching the gospel, but I don't have any reason to boast. Why? For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, watch this, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. 
But if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Notice verse 22. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Now here's Paul. He says, I preach the gospel. Well, yeah, that, we know, Paul. You, you started churches all over the place. And quite frankly, uh, those of us here, let's just do a quick question. Is there anybody here you are uh, of Jewish descent, like whole, whole, whole full-on Jewish? Mm, nobody. How many are in the other category? <laughs> Everybody. If you are here and you are not Jewish, it is because a man named the Apostle Paul went to the Gentiles. If anybody could boast for sharing the gospel, it was the Apostle Paul. And yet, Paul said, woe unto me if I don't do it. He says a, a, a dispensation. It means a, a, a period of time. He said, I am accountable, in other words, to the gospel. It's been given to me. It's been laid to my trust. It has been handed down to me. I have no choice but to do it. And the third thing I, I give here is a required commission. You know, anything less than the Great Commission, anything less than sharing the gospel for a Christian, is disobedience. If you've been saved, you've been called to share the gospel. Now, don't misunderstand me. I didn't say you've been called to preach. Or you've been called to become the next, you know, uh, Billy Graham or Billy Sunday. A lot of Billies that, pre that became evangelists. I don't know what the deal was. Billy Kelly, he was an evangelist. It doesn't mean that God's called you to be the next Apostle Paul or the next Adoniram Judson. It's a good name. Somebody should name a kid after that guy. What God is saying here, I've called you to tell others what I've done for you. I love the example of the woman at the well. The woman at the well did not have formal training as a, you know, a preacher or, or, or missionary. The woman at the well simply went to town and said, hey, come to this guy that told me everything I did. You've got to hear what this guy did for me. You've got to come. Is not this the Christ? And she went, I mean, she went to her neighbor. She went to her friends. She went to her people that she knew. That's what she did. She shared the good news. She shared the truth because she believed that she, she could. And so many of us, we make excuses for not sharing the gospel. But Jesus says, I've commanded you to. Let's look at one more passage of Scripture and we'll be done. Revelation chapter 2. And the Lord brought this passage to my, to my mind as I was sitting there listening to my wife's song earlier. Revelation chapter 2. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write. This is verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write. The messenger of the church. Uh, you know, that would be the pastor there. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them that are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and have not fainted. You know, that describes a lot of churches in our day and age. They're busy. They're hardworking. There's always something going on. There's always some labor. They, they try those that say they're apostles and are not, so their doctrine is sound. They hate that which is evil. They cannot bear it. They can't stand when evil is allowed to go un, uh, uh, un, unhindered. But verse 4, Nevertheless, 
Now, this is Jesus speaking, by the way. If you have a red letter Bible, these verses are probably red. Uh, Jesus is speaking here to this church in Ephesus. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Jesus is telling this church, you're doing good, you're, you're working hard, you're laboring, you can't stand that, you know, you can't bear them that are evil, you, you, you're standing against wickedness, you're standing for sound doctrine, but you've left the basic foundational truth I told you to do. You've lost your first love, which is ultimately him. See, that's, that, that's, that's the surest way to, for a church to die. When we leave our focus, we get so caught up in the stuff of the ministry, and it's so easy to do, that we lose our focus on who and why we're here. We lose our first love. We lose our first works. That is the gospel. That is sharing Christ with this world. That's the first thing the, the church was commissioned to do. And Jesus says, I, I want you to remember. I want you to look back. Remember from whence you've fallen. Look, look back at where you were. Go back to what I told you to do. And then repent. That means turn back around. Turn away from making ultimately the busyness the idol. The programs had become the idol. The events had become the idol. They had focused more on the event than they had focused on the Savior. And he said, I want you to turn from that, repent, or else. Or else what? He said, I'll remove your candlestick out of its place. Now, the context of that is given in chapter 1. We don't have time to dig into the whole chapter. But Jesus has given John a vision of, uh, of his throne room, and he stands in the midst of uh, these the seven golden candlesticks. Each candlestick represents a church. And the place where it is is, is its location, is its city, its existence. And Jesus says, if you don't go back and do the first work, I will remove you. That is a frightening statement. Jesus said to Peter, Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There is nothing that the forces of evil that Satan and his devils can do against the church. But if the church loses its first love, and gets out of priority, Jesus says, I'll take you away. And church, part of what we're doing here is we're just getting back to our first love. You know, I said it's a new strategy. It's a new, you know, we're moving into something new. We're really just going back to what we're supposed to be doing in the first place. We're going back to the gospel. We're going back to building relationships with people. We're going back to impacting our community. We're going back to sharing the love of Jesus with a lost and dying world. We're going back to helping people find the way, the truth, and the life. That's what we're doing. Plain and simple. Let's stand together. We'll close out with a time of invitation. As we have these mornings, you know, the Sunday morning service, Wednesday night service, we're gathered together as a congregation corporately. We're gathered together to worship our God. As you study the, if you were to study the topic of worship in the Bible, worship has so many things. Praise, adoration. And it also has confession, repentance, surrender. And as a church, both corporately and individually, I think it's time that we seriously take a look at our life and say, we're going to get back to this. It's time to get it right. It's time to repent. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed.